Hello, I'm Kirsty Young. Thank you for downloading this podcast of Desert Island Discs from BBC Radio 4. For rights reasons, the music choices are shorter than in the radio broadcast. For more information about the programme, please visit bbc.co.uk slash radio4. My castaway this week is Stephen Fry. It's tempting to unabashedly embrace the cliché he needs no introduction. Seems almost redundant to list his endless credits and achievements on TV, stage, film, radio and paper because... Well, because he's Stephen Fry and we've been watching, reading and listening to him for three decades. Marvelling at his highly impressive but lightly worn intellectual capacity, savouring his knowing and often frisky prolixity and admiring his untypical candour. And then there's the voice, a pitch-perfect cocktail of Englishness, erudition, mischief and warmth. A few of his triumphs include A Bit of Fry and Laurie, his highly acclaimed film performance as Oscar Wilde, his best-selling series of memoirs and his long-running chairmanship of the TV show QI. His troubles include falling on his face in the playground and breaking his nose, an early spell in prison for credit card fraud, coping with depression and kicking a 20-year-long cocaine habit. These days, it's impossible to ignore just how dashed happy he looks. He recently married. He says... If you talk about something, it gets it out, and like a wound, once you start getting the oxygen on it, it starts to heal. And so, Stephen Fry, welcome to Desert Island Discs. Um, Thank you, Kirsty. Healing and talking, then. We know you're very good at talking. More than any other castaway I think I've spoken to, your life is out there. You have written so much about it in quite a revelatory way. Um, Has all that made you feel better? Gosh, it's so hard to tell, isn't it? Because I can't have a parallel life in which I haven't spoken <laughs> to compare it with. But it seems to be that I have this this desire to bring out all the sores, as you put it. I, I can't understand it. I think it may have started as a fear of being found out. So I thought I might as well be open about everything to do with myself so that no one could discover it. And uh, if you're in the public eye and you have certain problems or certain issues, I think it's important to try and share and help, if, if that isn't too, too holier than thou. I, I've always had this image of myself when I'm about 14 or 15 as a rather miserable, lonely figure, and I, I think I still write to that character, um, and I want to tell them that it's going to be OK, and maybe it's guilt at my own luck. You've been married now to Elliot for five long months. Yes. How's it suiting you? <laughs> I'm just adoring it. I'm still very much in the honeymoon phase. I think we both are, I hope so. Um, and uh, new and miraculous things happened in our culture, and, and I wanted to celebrate that, and what better way than, than to be married? It's, it's bliss. I do carry a ridiculous beam on my face, and I can't help it. You've written that music takes you to places of illimitable sensual and insensate joy, that music is, in fact, the dog's bollocks. <laughs> did I say that? You did yeah. say that. And um, what, what does music do for you? When do you need the music? I find more and more, actually, I, I need it. I need it when I'm walking. I need it when I'm uh, in my uh, office study working. It's become so, so much a part of everything I am. And I'm still discovering new music all the time. And that's what's thrilling. And at least two of the pieces I've chosen are examples of this, a music that I've come to after years of almost resisting. Something to do with my father. We'll come to that, I fear. (laughs) Tell me about your first choice, Stephen Fry. Well, this is a perfect example. My father is a a wonderful musician. He was a, a, a choir boy at St Paul's Cathedral, and he plays the piano. One of the composers he most values is Johann Sebastian Bach. And for many years, he never really did it. I I could see the intricate patterns that were were very, very clever, but it never spoke to my soul, if you like. But especially thanks to one incredible figure, the eccentric and marvellous Glenn Gould, the Canadian pianist, I have come to value all of the keyboard works. So I'd I'd like to hear Glenn Gould playing Bach's Partita No. 1, the jig from it.
The Gigue from Bach's Partita No. 1 in B-flat major, played by Glenn Gould. I was in the back of a cab today, and I said I was coming here to, to record Desert Island Discs with you, and the, the cab driver said to me, does he know all that stuff on QI? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, he has a large pile of cards I in front of him, but I, but I get the feeling he probably memorises it, and once it's in, it's in. It, it tends to be, yes. I'm so fortunate in that regard. I do think um, memory is perhaps an under-celebrated uh, function or, or part, of, part of being human. Uh, the Greeks, Hesiod, I think in Daughters and the Knights, Mnemosyne is the, the mother of the muses, and I think that's really true. I think memory is the mother of all the arts. Um, you have many passions, I think it would be fair to say, included mm. among them cars, darts, Norwich Football Club and cricket. <laughs> Uh, what's the common theme? Kind, well, kind of theatre. With Cars, it was actually a particular passion in the 80s when I'd written the book, as it's called, of a musical, rewritten it, Me and My Girl. And it, it was a hit. It, it was a hit in the West End, it was a hit on Broadway and around the world, and I, I suddenly found myself in possession of a rather large amount of cash. <laughs> and I think having, as you mentioned in your introduction, been to prison for credit card fraud, I suddenly realised that now I was a real legitimate person and could spend my own money, and I overdid it. You know? It was just sort of nuts. You were a young man when that happened to you. I'm wondering if, at that point, it increased your your sense of... You've spoken sometimes about this feeling of separateness from the world. Yeah. Did that... Was that, you know, going out and buying eight cars is one thing, but it only reinforces the fact that you're, you're not like other people. Yeah, and joining clubs was another thing I did. I, mean, I must be a member of nine clubs. And um, I think it reflects a need to be a part of the world and connect. But I have this other pull, which is to be apart from. And, and I think that's what sort of often tears me apart, because I've never joined in. Music and dancing and um, performing in sport and everything, I, I'm just hopeless at. And I feel, I feel inadequate and I'm terrified of being laughed at if, if ever I'm asked to sing or dance. So I deliberately do a comic dance because I don't know any other kind. Um, and, and I can't paint and I can't, you know, I can't do almost anything except use words, use language. And so that's what I've poured all my joy into, really. Um, language. Language and expression and words then a sort of a, a, a carapace as well as a comfort? They very much are, yes, absolutely. But it's interesting, isn't it? The, the the nature of oneself, it's a bit like a signature. You know, when you're a teenager, you tend to practice a new signature all the time. And yes. uh, and you think, oh, I think I'll do a straight down Y or I'll do a you know an F that's backwards or something. And then after a while, it becomes your signature. And it's a bit the same with your personality. When you're a teenager and a, and a young adult, you think, I'll try this pose, I'll try this interest, I'll try this style of dress. And then slowly, it is you. Let's have your next piece of music. Tell me about your second choice. Uh, well, now, a composer I absolutely love is uh, Franz Schubert. And one of his best-known and most wonderful pieces is the Trout di Forella, um, which is a song, in fact. And I particularly want this version because I have a friend called Thomas Addis, who is one of the great British composers and conductors and pianists, and he's playing the piano in this version of the Trout Quintet. Variations 2 and 3 from Schubert's Piano Quintet in A with your good friend Thomas Addis there. Uh, you were born in Hampstead in London in 1957 mm -hmm. to Alan and Marianne Fry. I don't need to tell you that, really, but I'm <laughs> telling the listeners. Um, who stands out more strongly in your childhood memory, particularly, your mother or your father? Well, my mother through presence and my father through absence. I mean, not um, not actual <laughs> absence, but he worked extraordinarily hard. And... 
I felt very in awe of him. Um, he was gaunt and pipe-smoking and had a mind of extraordinary, fierce, logical, analytical genius. Extraordinary man he is. Um, but he was also quite impatient of children, and he especially didn't like me sitting watching television or being in the house reading when I could have been outside or, or doing what he did when he was a boy, like building an outboard motor or a radio, <laughs> which he did. But my mother was a warm... Uh, presence, Im immense faith in me, so important, especially in my young life, troubled as it was, was the fact that she never, ever lost faith in my abilities. I'm interested to concentrate on your early childhood, and mm. you've written of it, you say, you know, you're always in trouble, never stable, never settled, or secure. Mm. Now, you see, if you've got a very loving mother, it's, it's, it's yeah. you know, it's tempting to wonder why. It is puzzling. Um, in my early-ish teenage, I, um, I was sent to a psychiatrist, and he was a little bit frustrated that my parents weren't in the diplomatic corps or in the army, because uh, everything that I did and uh, all my troubles seemed to fit in a syndrome of someone who had absent parents or yes. or moved a lot and didn't have a settled and secure nest. But I did. But it was in the country, deep, deep in the country. Um, as Sydney Smith, the great Sydney Smith, said, simply miles from the nearest lemon. And uh, it, was a, it, it was a bit of a... It was a bit of a blow for me because I had... I was a sort of male Madame Bovary. I had fantastic dreams of myself being a huge success, both uh, sort of romantically and uh, striking a figure in the world. And you can't do that in the middle of the lanes of Norfolk. But you were sent to boarding school at seven, which would have been typical yeah. for somebody from your background. Mm -hmm. And one can't help thinking that all of the things you did there, and you were terribly, mm -hmm. terribly naughty, were, were a bid for your parents' attention. Now... I, I, I mean, I'm sure that is true. Uh, you have to remember, though, that that was the fate of my brother and of my parents themselves when they were young. So there was no sense of feeling uh, abandoned in, in a strange way. And it's perhaps difficult then to explain quite why my brother didn't seem to have the same issues that I did. Um, could I put it down to, to something as banal as artistic sensibility? Do you think you were just sort of incredibly sensitive and perceptive and rather an open wound? I think that is true. I think I was... I'm still very sensitive. I absolutely can't bear it when people are nasty about me. <laughs> that sounds really silly. Because if you're in the public eye, they're going to be nasty about you, whoever you are. I mean, if you were Francis of Assisi rolled into, um, you know, Shakespeare and, uh, you know, if you were an utter genius and the most benign figure in the world, someone would be writing something nasty about you, especially in the current world of, of, of social media. And maybe I should be stronger. I tweet, but I don't read tweets, which is very, perhaps... Sensible. I think sensible. It reminds me of Noel Coward's great remark, you know, when he was asked if he'd seen something on television, and he said, television is not for watching, it is for being on. And, uh, and I feel t t Twitter isn't for reading tweets, it's for tweeting. Let's have your third. What are we going to hear, Stephen Fry? Well, um, Beethoven, you cannot escape the greatness of Beethoven. I think perhaps of all the artists and humans in history that I've ever read about, the most great humanitarian, the one who most speaks for all of us. And again, my father always used to go on about his late quartets, and I found them frightening and strange and disturbing. But that's because they are frightening, strange and disturbing, but they're also transcendently beautiful. And uh, this is the uh, 14th quartet, and the presto from it, the fifth movement, uh, in C-sharp minor, and, and it, it, it so bustles with life. Um, is it angry or is it puzzled? Is it sorrowful? It's all the emotions in one. It lives with you forever, this piece. Mm-hmm. The Guarneri Quartet with the presto from Beethoven's String Quartet No. 4, Opus 131. Why so often do you denigrate your own intellectual capacity? 
Well, I, there's a part of me that feels a bit like Salieri, you know, in the um, uh, Amadeus, the Peter Schaeffer play, that that I have just enough talent to recognise real talent in others, but I don't have quite what they have. I'm not a real intellectual. I'm not, I mean, you know, I'm not like some of the academic friends I have. And I'm not an artist, and, and I really respect artists. I can remember when I used to go to the Groucho Club a lot, and in the very early days, this figure from Leeds would appear and we'd fall into conversations. And I was absolutely fascinated by his self-confidence, by his absolute certainty about everything. And it was Damien Hirst. And I thought he just has some strange gift in his head that allows him to look one thing and one thing only and decide upon it and think about it hard and not get distracted by what people think. And I care so much about what people think about me. You still do? I think I do. I think less perhaps than I used to. But you can't be an artist if you care about what people think. But you can be an entertainer. And I think that's probably what I was put on this earth to be, to entertain, to please, if you like. When did you first learn that you did absolutely have the facility to entertain? I think, actually, at school, like a lot of entertainers, it it was being the class clown, um, and I was pretty good at that. I was a good impressionist, so I could always do different teachers, and that always delighted people. Always went too far. I was always the one facing the class, doing expressive and extraordinary things, then seeing their faces and thinking, oh, he's come in, hasn't he? He's standing behind me. Yes, he is. And out you go, Fry. And, and so it was all part of that. There was something transgressive about entertaining. I think that's what was interesting to me. And... I think it always should be a little bit transgressive, and that's what comedy should be. What do you think the teachers thought of you? I mean, report cards and so on, what did they say? Uh, Some of them were quite uh, florid in their denunciations. Uh, Others were weirdly uh, complimentary when I look back on them. When I started stealing at school, I I was sent to a psychiatrist because they thought I must be mad, Um, (laughs) who happened bizarrely to be a Conservative health minister. Uh, called Dr Gerard Vaughan yes. and since having had the opportunity to see what he wrote and this was, I was 15 I think and he wrote bipolar question mark it, it was really extraordinary um, but my particular version has expressed itself a lot in mania I have, you know, hypermanic, and I would, that's what I was as a teenager. It couldn't contain me. It was like, I don't know, being a tiger in a very small cage. I was just bound to try and break it. D- does it make you feel sad to think of that? I mean, it makes me feel very sad, and I didn't know you. You know, it, it does make me feel sad. There are all kinds of things I wish I had done. Of course, when you when you get to your you know, mid to late 50s, as I'm in, you, you start thinking about all the opportunities that you missed as a, as a young person. Um, on the other hand, I'm happy now. So I can't be sure that everything that went before wasn't, you know, a pathway to present felicity, (laughs) if you like. Let's have your next piece of music. Tell me then about this. It's your fourth choice of the day. Well, when all the problems, I won't say faded away, but a lot of them seemed to, I I found myself in Cambridge in my last year joining the Footlights, uh, which was headed by one Hugh Laurie. And every time Hugh and I went to the club room to practice sketches, to write, to do things. He would sit at the piano for a while, and one of the pieces he would play was the piano music that used to introduce film night. And I later discovered that it was actually a song with wonderful lyrics, and it's most beautifully sung by the great Nina Simone. I wish I knew how it would feel to be free I wish I could break All the chains holding me I wish I could say All the things that I should say Say I'm loud, say I'm clear For the whole round world to hear I wish I could share All the love that's in my heart Keep us apart I wish you could know What it means to be me Then you'd see and agree That every man should be free Nina Simone with I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free. So you've spoken a lot then about all of these these you know problems throughout your childhood and, and, and adolescence. And yet here you sit today as this person as well known as uh, accomplished and successful as you are. And therefore, I wonder, was there a, a sort of single moment that was a turning point when suddenly 
everything went in a very different direction. Well, it's, for me, there's no doubt that university was a complete change of everything. Up until then, all my life had been a kind of failure, so much so that obviously I'd ended in prison. Uh, and from then on, things seemed to go so much better for me. Did you win praise, great praise from your parents for managing that? Uh, yes, yeah, they were, they, were, they were intensely proud. Did you get a good degree? Uh, two one, not bad. It would have been an outrage if I'd got a first, to be honest, because I did absolutely no work. I went to three lectures in my entire three years at Cambridge, I think. I, I just spent every moment of the day doing drama. I, I would do seven, eight plays a term at least. Um, Whenever I've read about your time that you've written about yourself at university, it seems like this golden time and you made, you know, Emma Thompson and so on and you, mm. Laurie, of course, we know about these, these very solid friendships that would last you uh, all the way through your life. But uh, given that the first time that you had attempted suicide was at 17, did you feel at university mm. that, that, that you were free of this, that you were de- deeply mm. happy? Yes, I thought, actually, that I'd sort of reinvented myself. I thought that that person, that uh, weltering in misery... Uh, uh, th- through his adolescence, was was dead. Was like a, you know, like a caterpillar, and I was a butterfly. But of course, you're not. You're the same. Um, so that that part of me was always carried inside me. But it was such an exciting adventure, being at being at a university, especially after that horror. I think. Um, depression, characterised by the the author Matt Haig so succinctly as this disease of thoughts. Can you yourself tell? when it's on its way? Um, yes. It's a kind of tightness uh, in the chest and my heart beats so that I can feel it all over the chest. And, of course, a, a, a sort of darkness. Of, uh, it's hard to say exactly. It's a sucking. It's as if something's being sucked from you and the things that are being sucked from you are energy and hope, a sense of a sense of the future. You have no sense of the future at all. It, it, it is meaningless and black and has no um, prospect of, of, of being anything other than that. Has there been a cost to you? And I understand what you said earlier, that, you know, if you can get air around these subjects, but is there, is there a personal cost to you in putting all of these truths about your mental health out there? I think there is, and I hadn't realised that there was. For start, I'm obviously not a doctor or a, or a therapist or any kind of professional, but... I can become a sort of professional in terms of a go-to person. Yes. And, and I actually find that a bit destructive to myself because it means I'm, I'm never free of thinking about my mental health or other people's mental health. Let's have your next piece of music. We're on your fifth. Do tell me about this. Uh, well, I hope your hearts won't sink when you hear that it's <laughs> going to be Wagner. Uh, I made a film about this extraordinary, puzzling, beguiling, maddening man. Um, this is to me as transcendent and rapturous as anything that was ever written. It's Tristan and Isolde. Sink Down from Act Two of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, sung by Hirschten Flagster and Ludwig Zuthaus from the 1952 recording conducted by Wilhelm Furtwängler. Stephen Fry, I, I read that when your younger sister was seven, you sat her on a windowsill and said that your magic could make her fly. Um, I, are you still full of devilment? I'm a wicked, wicked, nasty piece of work <laughs> to, to, to have done that to a seven-year-old girl. Um, she trusted me implicitly, my sister Jo, and I had told her that I would teach her to fly, but only on her seventh birthday. And I perched her on the windowsill at the top of the house and told her, go on, off you go. Fortunately, she didn't believe that she did have the power to, to fly, and she learned a bitter lesson about her brother, I suspect. Amazingly, we do get on. But yes, I do have an imp of mischief in me that I don't suppose will ever be expunged. Why did you decide to write about your cocaine habit? 
Well, I felt I couldn't write about those years of my life in, in my autobiography, given that it was sort of going from one period to another to another. Uh, it would just be a lie if I missed it out. It but would... then you didn't have to write another autobiography. You're absolutely right, Kirsty. And uh, part of me wishes I hadn't... The, the whole thing slight, slightly makes me blush and, um, <laughs> and tremble. Well, I fear I may make you blush a little more then, because I'm, I'm dying to know what your good friend, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, made of your admission that you tooted away in the bathrooms of Buckingham Palace. <laughs> I, I, I think it's safe to say that... <laughs> He, he knows I'm naughty. And right. I, I think he's not a judgmental, mean, uh, prissy sort of man. Um, I, I think he would not be especially pleased at the idea of people doing that in the palace. Um, but uh, nor would he uh, leap to, uh, you know, to point to the exit door and say, never return again. I, I, I would say this, uh, without, I hope, letting myself off the hook, is that if you have... Uh, a condition where your moods are a victim of some strange illness inside your mind and brain, but you don't know you've got an actual illness with a name. You don't. You haven't seen a doctor about it. Alcohol and street drugs change your mood in a way that nothing else will. And it's, of course, a, a bad idea. It actually exacerbates the problem. And obviously, I don't want sound as if I'm saying it's all the fault of my mental illness. But I do think that was an element. I do think it was a strong part of it. And really, once I was properly diagnosed, then the, the need seemed to fall away. Tell me then about this. We're going to your sixth. Well, also, at that um, Footlights club room piano, when Hugh sat there, he didn't just play uh, I Wish I Knew How It Feel To Be Free. He also played Would You Believe What A Friend We Have In Jesus?, but he sang the version for the film Oh Lucky Man, and it's called Changes, and it's one of my favourite tracks. Everyone is facing changes No one knows what's going on And everyone is changing places Still, the world keeps moving on Love must always change to sorrow And everyone must play the game Because it's here Today and gone tomorrow Still the world goes on the same That was Hugh Laurie with Changes. What is it you call each other, my good friend? My colleague. My colleague. My colleague. In 2012, you received great praise for your depiction of Malvolio in Twelfth Night Opposite Mark Rylance's Olivia. You played first at the Globe, then I think it transferred to the West End, and then you went to Broadway where you That's were right. uh, nominated for a Tony. Um, you did look like a fish in water on that stage at the Globe. Do, oh, do, it, do you want to do more? I'd love to. I'd really love to. I, I enjoyed it as, as much as anything I've ever done, actually. It's a fantastic feeling. There's a lot of vocal work, uh, which we all did, and, and, and a lot of you know playing games with balls and things like that, which seems... Which I would have found totally pretentious when I was uh, um, 20. I even had to dance, which was just horrifying. At the end, there's a sort of jig, and I kind of managed to do it on some nights. And the Globe in particular is a remarkable theatre. Um, the, the relationship you have with the audience is quite unlike any other that I've ever known. Um, was it the first time that you had been on stage since Famously Cellmates, which you, you had to you felt you needed to abandon because it yeah. wasn't going the right way? Was that the first time you'd been back on stage? It, it was, the first time in a play, yeah. So it was, you know, it was possible that some sort of storm would happen in my head just before going on for the first night. And I was aware that there might be... You know, trouble in store, but it really was, as much as anything, a fantastic company of players um, that just gave me such confidence. Am I right in thinking that in 2012 there had been, as you well, you just said it, there a storm in your head? What a you know, what an apt description. You, you'd mm. suffered earlier in the year. Was that was that at the thought of this great challenge that lay ahead? Was it in any sense connected? No, it wasn't actually. In fact, I think the 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 the, 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 the terrible breakdown I had, which was filming in Africa, which was a 
Um, and I, it was just awful. And I had to come back to England in a, in a really dire state, but good came out of it. I met my psychiatrist there. It sounds so American, doesn't it? Um, and uh, things just clarified in my head. Um, you, you more than hinted earlier at the fact that, that much of the torment that you've gone through has also meant that you are the person you are, who mm. does all the things that you do. If you, if you had the choice to live without your bipolar condition, what, what choice would you make? It's interesting. I, I, I wouldn't want anyone to underestimate the seriousness of, of a condition like that. It, it, can, it can shorten lives, um, sometimes traumatically and terribly. Um, it, can, it can be a terrible um, effect on families and people around you. But it's so hard to separate it from oneself. W. H. Auden, the poet, perhaps put it best. He said, uh, don't get rid of my devils because my angels will go too. Time for your seventh. Tell ah. me about this and why indeed you have chosen this. I had to have a song that I could, as it were, dedicate to or that would make me think of the great love of my life, my husband, Elliot. And this song is a simple, beautiful expression of love. This is just pure loveliness sung by the great Ella Fitzgerald. It's Cole Porter's Do I Love You. Do I love you? Do I? Doesn't one? sun should desert the day what would life be will I leave you never could the ocean leave the shore Ella Fitzgerald singing Do I Love You and Chosen Stephen Fry for your husband Elliot and and I notice that he now regularly makes the gossip columns for such outrages as scraping the bumper of his car. Uh, you've you've <laughs> had thirty so. years to, to, to get used to that sort of attention. How's he coping? He's coping very well, and it's one of the things I have to apologise <laughs> to him for. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm walking on the street and people will cluster around me for a photograph or something, and they will almost literally elbow him out the way, not meaning to particularly be rude, but just they've seen someone they've spotted on the television before and they want him you know to be all theirs and they don't notice anybody else who's with him and and he copes that extremely well would you like to bring up children together well we, we you know we sort of talk about it and um I, I i suddenly think oh my goodness i'm such an age now but actually maybe that's rather good uh, <laughs> but we better get on with it if we do <laughs> what would you like to have, have told your 16 year old self Well, of course, I would like him to calm down. I'd like him not to be so miserable and unhappy. But there's much about him that I admire. I admire his kind of emotional engagement with everything. And it would be a shame to lose that youthful feeling that that the world is sort of almost on fire. And maybe that was a part part of my madness, but I think it's a valuable one because the world is on fire. It's, everything about it is astonishing, remarkable, and to be experienced and enjoyed. And if you have the great privilege of not believing in life after death, it means you value every second so completely because this world is ours for a short, short period and then it'll be other generations who have it. And so we might as well make the most of it. It's time for your final disc, Stephen Fry. Tell me about this. Well, there's a British composer called Arthur Wood who wrote uh, uh, a suite of music called My Native Heath and includes a maypole dance, which I'd very much like to hear. I think on my desert island, if I heard this, it would take me all the way home and it would be all about the beautiful, wonderful country that I love and come from. It's also known as Barwick Green. It may be familiar to some of your listeners, I'm not sure.
all of the Radio 4 listeners are now utterly confused. They think there's been some terrible cock-up in continuity. That was uh, Arthur Woods, Barwick Green, also known, of course, as the theme from Radio 4's The Archers. It was the maypole dance from the suite called My Native Heath, played by the Sydney Torch Orchestra. So, Stephen Fry, the moment has come. I'm mm. going to give you the complete works of Shakespeare. Have you read the complete works of Shakespeare? I have, actually. It's one of the things I did before I took the Cambridge entrance exam was I wrote out a scenario. I've still got them at home uh, in Norfolk, a scenario of every single play in Covered Inks. It was really kind of sort of anal and weird. Well, we give you that, and we will give you to the Bible. Have you read all of that? Most of it, actually. It's obviously a book you should read, and it's fascinating. I love it. And I will be fascinated to know what book you're going to take along with them. T.S. Eliot is a favourite poet, and I particularly love his four quartets. We shall give you that. A luxury item too. Well, it's a whole area of endeavour that I admire enormously is art, and yet I can't paint. And so I'm going to have all the time in the world, so I'd like some canvases and easels and watercolours and oils and acrylics, I think, and all the brushes and turpentine and linseed that go with them, and possibly an instruction manual. We can certainly manage that. And which of these eight tracks, if you had to save just one, which one would it be? Well, I couldn't contemplate living... I know it sounds so <laughs> pretentious, but I couldn't contemplate living without Beethoven's late quartet, so that's, that's the one I'd take with me. That's yours then. Stephen Fry, thank you very much for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. Thank you, Kirsty. You've been listening to a download from the BBC. You'll find more information on the Radio 4 website, bbc.co.uk slash radio4.